Um, my name is Cassie, and my project focused in the Zenison Valley, and I wanted to better understand how the NRA community here um, engages with the food system. So I was interested in understanding what was working, what wasn't, and what opportunities there were for greater resilience. Um, I have an extensive background with food systems and sustainability, and I have noticed that in the local food movement, there is a distinct lack of diversity. So that's something that I wanted to explore. So who are the immigrants in the Denison Valley? Um, it's first important to note that immigrants come here from all over the world, from different cultural backgrounds and ethnicities, um, and so I don't want to discount that. I did focus a lot of my research on a specifically unique group we have in this area, the Cora indigenous people. Um, the most Korra living outside of Mexico, where they're from, is live within Gunnison, Delta, and Olathe. Um, and so this is an indigenous group, and they obviously have some unique challenges, but I think that it's we're really lucky to actually have them in our most immigrants and community. Um, immigrants come here and live in our community for the same reasons we do. They enjoy the quality of jobs, they enjoy the safety of a small town, and they want to create better opportunities for their family. Um, so why use this community as a metric for resilience? Unfortunately, communities of color disproportionately experience social injustices and environmental um, degradation at higher levels. And so if you're going to really look at community resilience, it's important to address the threats of um, your minority population first, and that will increase overall community resilience. So um, I want to look at this from the Indian perspective. First, I'm going to talk about um, the social area um, and how this relates to the Gunnison Valley. So it was in important for me to better understand how to make an invisible population within our community more visible. From an ecological perspective, um, I wanted to better understand how increased involvement in the local food movement could lead to climate resilience. Um, specifically, when the benefits of small-scale <coughs> agriculture are well noted, but you're not often seeing those connected to the mitigation potential of greenhouse gases. Um, and then from an economic perspective, um, the interest and growth of the local and organic food industry is well known. There's more farmers markets in the U.S. today than ever before. I was interested in better understanding how that economic vitality could be harnessed to benefit our local community. Specifically, how perhaps the local food movement could better not only serve the immigrant community, but also engage them in their diverse and cultural perspectives. Quickly, what is food sovereignty? So what's important to understand about the concept of food sovereignty is that it focuses first and foremost on self-reliance and self-organization through the entire food system from production to consumption. And this is what makes it different than food security, which most often, often focuses on consumption alone. And so it ensures that, there's, that equity is achieved for both people, the land, and culture. Um, I implemented a social science research model where I did one-on-one -on -one interviews as well as focus groups. What was most important to me with working with my diverse population was that I gained trust with the community. So in order to do that, I wanted to meet them on their level. Um, so I started volunteering with English language learners classes that are offered by the Center for Adult and Family Education. And I spent about 40 volunteer hours before I started asking any questions. And so what happened is when I actually started to implement my focus groups and talk to stakeholders, there was already an initial trust there. And I felt like they could be more honest with me about comments that topics around food security that most often they don't talk about publicly. So, my research findings kept coming back to this statement, that food sovereignty, first and foremost, is the best pathway to increase food system resilience in the Gunnison Valley. Unfortunately, at this time, there's not a single organized movement towards food sovereignty occurring. I believe that food sovereignty is really important because it not only creates a pathway to address the barriers facing the immigrant community, it also allows them a means to celebrate their own cultural traditions. And then finally, by promoting food sovereignty in the immigrant community, it would increase overall visibility of that community um, and overall community resilience. So the first thing I did is identify the main organizations that serve the immigrant community within the Gunnison Valley. These are some of them there. Um, I identified 10 primary organizations. I want to note that there's probably most likely more organizations than this, but based on my research and work with my community advisor, these are the organizations I chose to focus on. Um, they cover education, social service, governmental, and religious backgrounds. Um, what's important about this chart is that after um, identifying organizations, I wanted to identify key resiliency themes. And so those themes were food security, food sovereignty, health education, this includes both medical and nutrition education, 
a provider of actual food, um, translation and legal services, and then also a promoter of cultural integrity. So what I want you all to note is that no single organization in the Gunnison Valley today is meeting all these resiliency themes. That's not a bad thing, it just notes that we, the importance of these organizations working in a connected manner to better serve the community. Um, and then also what's happening is that currently some organizations, specifically CAFE, Multicultural Resource Services, and Immigrantes Unidas, um, are being overutilized almost to the point of exhaustion. They don't have enough resources to serve the community, while others, such as the Food Pantry and Mount Roots Food Project, there's some potential for the organizations to be better utilized. So based on my stakeholder interviews, they came up with nine key barriers that were facing the immigrant community. First, there's health concerns. These mostly were around women, prenatal care, and children. There was also an overall concern about the cost of food and the access to healthy, affordable food. There was immigration issues, and over and over again, I heard from stakeholders that if immigration reform could be reached, many of these other social inequalities could be addressed. Um, in terms of social inequalities specifically, I heard over and over again about a sorry, lack of education and a lack of professional opportunities being major, major hindrances. And then in terms of language barriers, especially for the core population, um, they speak in an uh, indigenous language. And so for them to learn English and to learn how to write in English is a third language for them. And they're not always necessarily coming from traditional education backgrounds. Um, there was issues with housing and child welfare. There's many mentions that I heard of a lack of strong male role models within the community. Um, again, a lot of mentions around diet, but I just want to focus on some of the key themes. So many people felt that there was a high knowledge of what healthy, organic, and local were, but there wasn't very much of an interest. And part of that had to do with this perception that healthy equates to expensive. Um, and then also, there's not so much of a culture around preventative health care. So it was hard to connect people with the idea that if you took a run or if you decided to eat a salad for lunch, that that could prevent you from having to go to the doctor later. And then while there was a high interest in cooking, um, there was a low interest in gardening. And I feel like this could have to do with that cooking is a basic human need where gardening is perceived as a hobby. Then finally, there was concerns over culture loss especially with the younger generations, and then some cultural differences within the immigrant community as well as with the broader community. Um, in terms of the focus groups, many of the themes that the immigrants themselves identified were similar, but I'm just going to focus on some ones that were specifically interesting. Um, first of all, many mentioned that um, their diets have changed since they've made their homes in the Gunnison Valley. They've had an increased consumption of junk food, both for themselves and for their children. This has led to many people feeling like they are not happy with their weight and they want to work on it, Yes, they all, yet they also identified a lack of time, both for the activities of exercise as well as healthy cooking techniques. So, in addition to these barriers, I really want to focus that there was many resiliency themes that were identified, and almost all of them, over 75 mentions, related to cultural traditions. I think that this quote says it well. I miss the corn, the corn in Mexico. In the mountains where my mom was born, there is a white corn and it tastes really different than corn in the city. In, in the city, they grow yellow corn. It tastes very different. So the tortillas taste different. I really miss the white corn. The chickens eat the corn, the pigs eat the corn from the mountain. But in the city, they grow the chickens with feed and the pigs, and it tastes different. The animals fed by white corn are much better. The corn up in the mountains is different. Um, so, what this chart is showing is that I began to be able to identify some resilience opportunities within the community. And so, um, I identified six key themes that could offer a springboard for future action to work towards food sovereignty. First and foremost, immigrants' family is central to their lives. And in many ways, it's a, they are living in multi-family units and they have strong connections back to their home countries. I also found that many of them, while even being here for many years, would still tend to treat Mexico as their home as opposed to Gunnison. Um, I also heard over and over again that nearly all immigrants cook every meal at home. They're most often cooking from scratch and they're cooking in a traditional way to their culture. Especially for the Cora, I heard many mentions of how they made their own tortillas, and this provides an opportunity perhaps for some next steps towards food sovereignty. Um, religious institutions in this community are really the gathering place of the immigrant community. Uh, there are lots of uh, celebrations that all involve food. And then finally, many immigrants <coughs> spoke fondly about their connections to farms and lands of their childhood. So I think it's really important to note that while we've talked about barriers here today, I think there's also a lot that the immigrant community can teach our broader community in the Gunnison Valley. So when I ask stakeholders the question, what lessons of resilience can the immigrants 
immigrant community teach the greater Denison Valley? This is what I heard. Um, and I think one stable in particular says it in a very nice way. I don't want to think in general. Every single family is unique. There could be a very health conscious poor family or one that does not care at all. I do not like to think in things culturally because everyone is different. We all are in the, some, in the end in a village far from home. Um, so what I think is important here is to focus on the need to continue to support the organizations that already exist within our community that are working every day to serve this community. Um, and then also that I would like to be able to start to move the conversation beyond access, allowing this community to use the local movement, food movement to integration, where it's a two-way street of information sharing. Because um, our immigrant community, especially the core community, have very unique cultural traditions and connections to land that we as a broader community can learn from from them. So in terms of, I created 10 key resiliency recommendations but all of them come back to this idea. I really feel that the kitchen is a cultural bridge because first and foremost, we need to meet this community at where they're most comfortable. And so I would like to kind of promote this idea of if community members were able to become leaders and take an education role within their community, this is something known as a promotora model, um, this could increase overall participation in our food system. And so if that starts in the kitchen, that will first create um, increased knowledge and nutrition. And then at that point, that can be a springboard for greater participation in community gardens and gardening activities. And that would take the garden from a hobby to the idea that growing your own food can save money. So um, I would like to focus on this because this is a resiliency recommendation that I actually implemented. Um, and this is the food resource guide. And in order to address um, the the issue of a lack of connectivity between resources available to the immigrant community, I wanted to create a one-stop shop that could provide information on free and reduced food resources, healthy lifestyle choices, and healthy cooking opportunities available in the Gunnison Valley. This guide is available in English and Spanish, and there's a bunch at the door. So um, primary audience is the immigrant community, but I, it could be a service of anyone, and I'd actually really appreciate it if you guys took some and could share them, because that's the point. Um, it's available in print, it's also available um, on the web, and graciously, Mountain Roots, as well as Gunson Health and Human Services, has committed to hosting the guide on our <coughs> website. And then I just want to finally take a second to thank um, my community sponsor, Karen Hausdorfer. I couldn't do this without her. Also, I wanted to thank my advisor, Kate, and then two women, specifically Marketa Zubkova and Ellen Peterson. Um, they work in the immigrant community every single day um, on issues that are much broader than food insecurity alone. And if it wasn't for them and their support, I wouldn't have been able to make sure that the, my final product, my research project, was culturally appropriate, that the language was also locally appropriate, and really was a resource that the immigrant community could use. So, um, if anyone has any questions, Um, I took out the slide about this because I didn't know if I have time, but I'm really happy that you brought that up. So right now, Mountain Roots is um, working on a community-sourced CSA. Um, and so that's something that's actually happening this summer in 2016. So they have shown interest as an organization of wanting to include tortillas or tamales um, if there was um, interest from the immigrant community in producing those. And due to cottage food license changes that happened in the state of Colorado in 2012, it would actually be possible for many of these Cora and other immigrant women to produce this food in their homes legally, and that potential has the potential to be part of that CSA model. Um, I think that has a two-way benefit, obviously an economic benefit for the immigrant community, but it also is working on that um, major issue of integration, and then just overall increasing the visibility of the population in the broader Valley. Has there been any movement to include the immigrant community in the farmer's market as sellers of products? Um, I don't know that specifically, but at this time I would say that the farmer's markets are really underutilized by the immigrant community. Um, a lot of that has to do, well there's a couple things. Um, there's obviously legal barriers, and I think that um, there's general fears about um, 
certain people's uh, immigration status here. There's also language barriers. And I really want to note that these are people that are often working multiple jobs, 12 to 14 hours a day, and then they're making a choice to come to English class for two hours twice a week in order to work on their English because they see learning English as the greatest opportunity to improve their status um, in the community as well as opportunities for their families. So I think that there are many opportunities for greater engagement. I know that the Gunnison Farmers Market has a double SNAP program. Um, not all immigrants qualify for SNAP, but if you had SNAP, you can't go to the Gunnison Farmers Market and turn it in for tickets that would be double um, value for what your SNAP is. I love that you spent 40 hours volunteering before you even asked a question. How did you sort of think of that idea and how might that apply to other people, whether they're undergrads or graduate students, thinking about starting their projects? Well, um, I mean, I have a Hispanic background, but I would say that I'm a white person. So I didn't want to be a savior going into this community and saying like, let me help you out and like, let me like teach you all that I know and I'm educated and academic and like, I really wanted to meet them where they were. And also I would say actually the IRB process, going through the IRB training, this is a major, um, so IRB is something that you have to go through in order to do human research on, an, on a university level. And so part of that process is you're working with a community that is perhaps like, um, has a unique, a unique aspect or could be threatened, whether that be a child or in this situation, um, legal status and immigration issues, you have to make sure that you're protecting that community. So this was actually an idea that I came out of the IRB process and how to engage with the community. And I would say the greatest compliment I got from this whole process was the final day that I volunteered in Marquetta's English class, we decided to have a party and I made pasole and one of the women told me that she thought my pasole was good and that was like the best <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I do want to say, I don't know if anyone else has questions, but there is really a lot of opportunities for this to continue as a project, um, whether that be at a doctor or undergrad level. But as I mentioned, I did have 10 resiliency recommendations. Um, Cold Harbor has shown interest in doing some partnership opportunities with this project in terms of perhaps a diversity garden or an aid co-op. There's also a woman in Southwest Colorado who is growing native corn. Um, and she has some interest in working to create a connection where she could get corn masa here which is one of the major issues identified is that there's not really high quality corn here. Um, and then that could help generate the business that I was talking about in terms of creation of tortillas and tamales and then sales of our community. Yeah, I'm just curious. I uh, just want to find out, uh, based on your research, apart from the Hispanic uh, community, which other diverse group uh, were you able to identify in Gunnison? Um, there's definitely some, uh, there's a few Chinese women that attend Karen's classes. Um, there's also some people from, uh, I want to say Chad, yeah. From, yeah, from Chad. And um, there is a woman from Brazil. And in terms of attendees to classes, I would say that was probably the most representation. Generally, most people are of Latin American origin. And, um, I would say maybe about half the people that attended classes were CORA. I know Multicultural Resource Services, which is a service that's funded by the county but is specific for the immigrant community, 51% of their clients are of CORA origin. But it's hard to get a good census um, estimate since a lot of them are not here legally of how many are here, but as I said, the highest, um, not really percentage, but like living in one place outside of Nayarit, Mexico is between Gunnison and Delta. Because uh, why I ask the question is just because sometimes uh, coming from Africa, I feel kind of isolated and you know I don't I really know what's going on in the Gunnison Valley. That's why I was curious asking that question. Thank okay. you. Um, thank you very much.